Just a note before we get into the episode. This episode of True Crime Conversations briefly involves the recounting of allegations of child abuse. Listener discretion is advised. It was the middle of winter, 1997, when Sally received an unremarkable phone call from her 51-year-old mother, Marion. Marion had left for a year or so trip abroad and laughed that she was having tea with some old ladies she'd met in Kent, England. I'll call you back, she said to Sally, on the other end of the phone. As far as Sally knew, her mother, who had been married and divorced three times, was travelling on her own. She needed a break. She'd sold her house in Queensland and wanted an adventure. But Marion never would call Sally back. Not a full year later, on Sally's wedding day, which Marion promised she'd be back for. Not when Sally gave birth to her first child, or when Marion's only son, Owen, died by suicide in 2002. It's been 22 years since Sally spoke to her mother for the last time. So what happened to Marion Barter? Could she have met with foul play? Or did Marion choose to vanish, to start a new life, without the family she loved so much? I'm Jessie Stevens, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. In this episode, we're speaking with Brian Seymour, a Channel 7 journalist and the host of the Lady Vanishes podcast, exploring the baffling case of missing Australian woman, Marion Barter. I want to start with a phone call between a woman named Marion Barter and her daughter Sally that happened in winter 1997. And so Marion was overseas at the time and she was sort of calling intermittently. She called Sally and then she said, I'll call you back and sort of hung up. And that seems to be one of the last conversations that they had. Can you talk us through what the next few weeks and then months looked like for Sally? Yeah, well, that that phone conversation, Marion was over in the UK on her extended holiday. She'd originally planned to go on the Orient Express, but didn't never got to that. And she told her it was from Tunbridge Wells, a little town south of London. And she'd been having tea with these nice old ladies. It was the last time that Sally spoke to her mum and she'd called her and left a message two days before because she knew that Sally was skiing at Perisher and there'd been the threadbow disaster that Stuart Diver survived mm. and she was worried for her safety. She finally got hold of her and the phone kept cutting out because she was putting money in and it had that delay that international calls do. This is pre-2000, pre-mobiles. And so Sally knew it was an international call and eventually the money ran out, the phone cut off, she never spoke to her mum again. And then Sally just assumed she'd see her mum in the next few weeks or maybe a few months. She was going to ostensibly go on holiday for a year, but she never thought she'd never see her mum again. And after, uh, I think it was about a month, her brother's birthday came around and her mother was very close to both her children, Sally and her brother Owen, and there was no call. That was highly unusual. And Sally started to get concerned. That's when she checked, this is about three months later, with the bank and was told that someone had been making large withdrawals from her bank account at the Commonwealth Bank branch at Byron Bay. Now, she lived on the Gold Coast, Mary. Mm. She was stunned into action. She grabbed a photo of her mum, her then partner, Chris, who's now her husband. They raced down to Byron Bay and started walking around the whole town showing people at the shoe shop, Lizzie's Shoes, where she used to buy shoes, and um, at the chemist, the supermarket, at the bank. She finally went to the bank and said, have you seen this woman? And the teller initially said no and then did something very strange and seemed to do a double take and then say, just give me a moment, I need to speak to my manager. Disappeared into the manager's office, came back out and said, is there anything you'd like to tell her if she shows up? Now, Sally didn't take that at the time as being particularly important. He wasn't saying, yes, she's been here. I, I, I can confirm that she's been the one coming in. But it did always sit in the back of her mind. Sally, after that, after finding out her, mother, her mother's account had been drained of $80,000 at the rate of $5,000 a day, over three and a half weeks, she went straight to the police at Byron Bay and reported her missing. And so that was her first port of call, though, was it, to go and check with the bank? It was, and and the, the other businesses around Byron Bay, thinking and hoping that her mum w- was back. Mm. She didn't know she was back. And but, so but she still imagines that her mother is in the UK on holiday knew. and then suddenly there's these withdrawals happening in Byron Bay. Yeah, randomly. And again, you know, 
the whole account was drained to zero. Now, why wouldn't you go in there if you're the account holder and do it all in one lump sum and one electronic transfer? It didn't happen. Went in day after day, withdrawing the maximum daily limit. In, in today's money, it'd be worth, I think, uh, $8,500 a day and drained the account to zero. Marion had valuable artwork and antiques stored that Sally was going to be looking after until she returned. They vanished. Oh, wow. And these were things that were precious to her, including paintings by Norman Lindsay and Arthur and Jamie Boyd. I mean, these were valuable ceramics, artworks, antique furniture. She decided that she was going to go on a holiday for a year and wanted to go to the UK. She'd always wanted to go on the Orient Express. It was one of her, you know, bucket lists. And um, I was all for it. I was like, you know what, go for it. You're single, you've got no ties here, you know, do whatever you need to do. And so what's happened is she's sort of disappeared. Sally has then gone and reported her missing after all of this time. As time passes, she then gets married to the person that she was engaged to. And Marion was meant to be at that wedding, wasn't she? Well, more than that, Marion used to be a, a teacher at the Southport School, which is an elite boys' school on the Gold Coast. And Marion, in 1996, had won Queensland's Teacher of Excellence Award. Her career was on a high and she loved teaching. It was her passion. Um, she taught her own children at the school. And... This school uh, had a wonderful chapel. Marion had helped arrange permission for Sally to marry her husband, Chris, in the school chapel. But again, when she did that later that year, her mother didn't show. So she's now at the point where her mother is nowhere to be seen, but it would appear that she's come back to Australia. A few very strange clues start to appear. Uh, The first being there's a name change. Can you talk us through what what happened there and how she came to discover that? That's a great question because Sally, for the first five years, relied on the police doing their job and was really not privy to what was going on. The police very quickly came back and told her, look, she's a thrice married woman. She's been married three times. We think she's gone off of her own account, taken the money out to buy a new house overseas with her new partner. Now, there's nothing nothing at all to back that up. Nothing at all. And, and, it, and no still, one knew she had a new partner or anything, right? Well, so that's well, just a theory. Officially, she never did. But this is just an assumption. But Sally was still trying with the Salvation Army Family Service. There was an article in New Idea in 2004. Nothing. Meanwhile, the police investigation really just stagnated. Nothing was done until... Ten years later, another police officer, and then two years after that, another police officer came on board and decided to have a fresh look at the case and started doing some investigative work. And it was actually one of the um, those detectives, Detective Sergeant Gary Sheehan, who's still officially in charge of the investigation today, who discovered and d- did the checks with Customs and Medicare and discovered that Marion had changed her name in May 1997 to Florabella Natalia Marion Remekel. Now... Sally was floored and stunned by this. That is a, a very unique name. Even today, mm. we can only find 106 people with the name Remekel in the world. Wow. Okay, 90 of them are in the US, the rest are in Luxembourg. So Luxembourg is the derivation for it. Years later, um, she, the police also found out Marion had used her Medicare card in 1997 in um, Griffith. The passport that she travelled to the UK from in 1997 was in that new name, Florabella Remichel. And it, according to official records, she returned on that passport three weeks after leaving Australia. Three weeks. So when she was on the phone to Sally, where was she? Well, as far as we know, where she said she was at Tunbridge Wells right. in London. She'd hired a car. In postcards, she'd written to her sisters and her family. She said, I feel very brave. I've hired a car. I'm driving here. I'm going to Alfriston to the castle at Tonbridge, to Tunbridge Wells and down down to Brighton. We went to the UK recently and re- re- retraced her steps, went to the actual places where she went and very detailed. But then someone, Marion or someone else using this name, returned to Australia the day after Marion had that phone call with her daughter. The next day, so August the 2nd, 1997, Flora Bella Remichel, the name Marion changed her name to, comes back to Australia. And that passport has never been used again. It lapsed in 2007 and it's never been used to leave the country. You know, the fact that she had on her customs card coming back into Australia that she was living in Luxembourg and was married 
and um, her new name was Ramakel. You know, Brian and I were kind of tossing around when we were in Luxembourg how weird that was because back in the day there was no Google and my mum didn't even have a laptop or a computer. So we questioned how she would come up with the idea of changing her name to Ramakel and saying she was living in Luxembourg and hence the 103 people that we have found who have the name Ramakel, majority of them all live in Luxembourg. And I just, there's something not quite right that's sitting there with me. She's changed her name. There is a hypothesis. Perhaps she's changed her name and she wants nothing to do with her family. Are you legally allowed to do that? Do you owe your family an explanation of where you are? You know, you are allowed to do it. Absolutely. And that, that's frustrating. Yeah. I mean, who would want to do that? But assuming you do, and, and people do it, I'll tell you one thing, because we, we looked at Marion possibly being in witness protection and that being a reason why we couldn't get much help from different authorities. And um, when people do go missing, of the 1,600 long-term missing in Australia, a small fraction walk out on their lives and get off the grid. And of the ones who do that, they, they, go, they go out for a carton of milk and they just never come back. Or they go to work and they just never come home. They don't go through this detailed, long-winded rigmarole. And then for those bank withdrawals that drained Marion's account, three of those withdrawals were at a suburb near where she used to live. So... Why would she, if she's already off the grid, changed her name, why would she show up where she could have been recognised by any number of people and Including walk around? Including her daughter. Yeah, and friends and colleagues and walk around the, the streets if she'd already removed herself from that life. Not to mention the fact that there were postcards being received after whoever was on that passport returned to Australia. Three weeks later, an elderly relative got a passport from the UK from Marion. Were so, there any hints while she was actually away that she was going to drop off the grid? Were there any hints that she was about to disappear? Zero. As I said, she just won the Queensland Teacher of Excellence Award. She was planning Sally's wedding with her. She was very close to Sally and her son, Owen, and very close to her own parents. She was happy, well engaged with the community. She was single. She'd been married three times. One of the reasons there's so much interest in this case is because Marion's first husband was Johnny Warren, the Socceroo captain who uh, captained the first Australian side to play in the World Cup and um, became a legend of the sport in Australia. That was her first husband, and they remained fond of each other throughout their lives. Sally told me that when she was um, playing soccer at school um, and Sally was born to Marion's second husband, Johnny would come down and coach the kids at the school. Wow. So, you know, that was a lovely story. And they, they were, um, by all accounts, and we've spoken to friends, including the man who introduced them, they were the loves of each other's lives. But Marion um, was single at the time, but no indication that she was planning to do anything like this. And again, the way she's done it is extraordinarily strange. And that name is so rare. Yes. Remakel. And we've got Google now, so I, I can look it up. But back then... It just seems to have no context. It's not one you pluck out of thin air. You'd pluck Jane Smith, surely. Exactly. Even if you were to make one up, th th this isn't a name that would feature. And it's so rare even now today. It's so unique. And there's two things. Police found out later that Marion had changed her name by deed poll to Florabella Remichel and that on that incoming flight from the UK, when you fill in the passenger card, yep. she'd filled in the passenger card as Florabella Remichel, occupation home duties, Luxembourg. Wow. So she herself has volunteered the name Remichel and the location Luxembourg. After we started this podcast, and one of the reasons we started it is because um, my executive producer, Alison Sandy, and I felt this was a great way to get as many people as we could involved to try and find a clue because it's just such a, a baffling and unique case. And I found my father after 20 years by going on enough rope with Andrew Denton. Oh, wow. So that's one of the reasons. That. Yeah, that's one of the reasons I'm involved. I'm good at finding people. I couldn't find my dad. And uh, so I, I know the power of um, publicity and helping with these cases. One of our wonderful, we've got, I think, three million listeners now. One of them, a wonderful researcher, trawled through the National Library of Australia and found a personal advertisement placed in a French-Australian newspaper in 1994 for a man, aged 47, single, sophisticated, cultured, looking for a woman for possible marriage. And he put his name as Monsignor F. Remichel. Wow. Now, we jumped on this. That's the only reference to the name Remichel, I think, ever in Australia anywhere. And the timing and the place, Lennox said, it's 20 minutes from where Marion lived. So we've got 
context for the name in a way where that might have come from. So, well, well, well Marion changed her name to that. She volunteered that it was from Lux. She was in Luxembourg. We then searched for tried to find the person who placed that ad, and we found one person on the planet with the name F. Ramakel, who's that age, and his description and his current age and description matches the person in that ad. So where is he residing in the world right now? Luxembourg. Did you chase him down? We did. And what did he say? Well, it, that's, um, I don't want to spoil this for <laughs> listeners, but it would be more extraordinary or as extraordinary for this person not to be involved as it is for them to be involved because the clues and the breadcrumbs that have led us along the trail to that door are irresistible and, and unique. A tiny ad placed more than two decades ago may hold the key to solving Australia's most baffling missing persons case. Marion Barter, the former wife of Socceroo great Johnny Warren, vanished in 1997 while holidaying in Europe. Now I stood there, I was shaking. I put my hand out to shake his hand, I introduced myself and he completely ignored me. And he looked at Sarah and he did not look at me the whole entire time I stood at his front door. And it's an astonishing story uh, because on the surface it could look, as police did assume, like someone had gone missing maybe of their own accord and they wanted nothing to do with their family. And I think that that's a sense that we might get early on. But then there are just all these clues. So, for example, I wanted to ask you about her relationships because that was a point you made earlier, that she was single, that she'd been married three times, but she had an interesting kind of relationship to men, didn't she, throughout her life? She, she loved men and uh, she never hid her relationships from her daughter. Um, she was um, a responsible um, adult and a wonderful single mum who cared brilliantly for her kids and maintained full-time employment and, and won awards for it. There was nothing ostensibly different or odd about that fact and that, that early police assumption that she'd been married three times, therefore she's the kind of woman who could just walk out on her family, was outrageous. I mean, it's just totally unfounded. The police protocol, their own protocol for a missing person is they can only be listed as located or the case closed if you physically cite them or you have a death certificate or you find remains. Neither of those things have happened. We got the police involved and they agreed to be to sit down and I interviewed the detective in charge of the case at length. So I asked him flat out, have you ever cited, spoken to or located Marion? No, we haven't. And yet they're listing her as located and assuming that she's walked away. Why do you think that they are listing her as located? Because wasn't Sally told a long time ago she's gone away and she doesn't want anything to do with her family? Where did that come from? That came from the Salvation Army Family Tracing Service, which is now defunct. It doesn't exist anymore. But back in 98, Marion's father, Jack, after, you know, speaking with Sally and the family, said, oh, this, this is no good, you know, the police have made an assumption on this. We need to find out what happened to Marion. So they went to the Family Tracing Service. In 1998, they eventually wrote back to Marion's father, Jack, in a letter that was thought lost for two decades, basically saying, oh, we've located Marion. She's fine, doesn't want anything to do with, with the family. We we're, we're consider the matter closed. Well, after our podcast started, Sally's cousin living in Japan went through his shoebox of family records and found that letter and sent it to us. The letter doesn't say anything of the sort. The letter says, listen to this, this is, and this is what we're coming across. You know, it's word of mouth versus proven fact, and, and we're, we're stripping them all back and finding the truth. This is a classic example. We look at the letter from 1998 from the Salvos. It says, dear Mr. Wilson, we have spoken to an investigator who has spoken to a security guard for a totally different bank, not the Commonwealth, I think it was Citigroup Bank, in Ashmore, which is not one of the locations, where Marion's money was taken, in 1990, not 1997, which can't be a typo because seven and zero aren't next to each other on the keyboard or on the number pad. And based on what that security guard told the investigator who spoke to us, we're saying she has chosen to walk away. I mean, it's, it's nonsensical, it's grotesquely inaccurate, and it has no bearing on fact. That's what the family was basing that assumption on for all those years. And that would be a real hurdle because then every time they've gone to the police to follow up, they're thinking, oh, we have a record here somewhere that she was found and you're just being sort of overreacting. Well, yes and no, because they lost the records. Sally had to go back in in 2010 and give them her DNA again 
and do another statement because they'd lost the original. And that DNA, what do you think they would have done with that DNA? Why would you take someone's DNA in a missing persons case? I mean, one obvious reason I can tell you is you run it against bodies that are found. Yeah, absolutely. No. So she could, like, she theoretically could have been found and they haven't done the, you know, correct protocols in order to identify her. Apparently not. There's too many unanswered questions. Um, I don't think the police have dug deep enough, um, in my opinion. And at the very beginning, it seemed easy, I guess, for them to just put her in a box and say, this is where you fit. So that's what we think. And um, I have had the detective tell me that their reasoning is based on assumptions. There's no proof to it. So that kind of upsets me a little bit too, because if I knew my mum was sitting on a beach in Venice having a great time, I'd be okay with that. But I don't know that. And they have told me flat out that they've never found her. They've never sighted her. Yet there's all this other contradiction. Why do you think that there has been such sort of this lazy response to her as a missing person. Well, look, our police aren't lazy. I'm very supportive of the police and they're out there to catch rapists and murderers and and keep us all safe and they do that. This is an extremely difficult, involved, expensive, time-consuming investigation and they have had people who've really committed themselves and, and, and large resources to doing that. For instance, Gary Sheehan, the detective who's still in charge, um, went through the file and found there was a tip from four years earlier before he came along in 2010, 2009, that Marion had been met, had met with foul play and was buried in a paddock at a property in Armadale in New South Wales. So he located what he thought the property was, took a cadaver dog and went and searched this property. He didn't find anything. He's done a lot of work and a lot of checks. Mm. He's the one who uncovered the name change, the passenger card, the fact the passport's never been used again. He's divining from that, that she's chosen to do this. And if she has, that's the thing, we're not saying she hasn't. We're just saying there's so many other things and behaviours and facts that we've uncovered that call that into question. We want to know what happened. And if it turns out she did walk away and do all of this in this convoluted, extraordinary fashion, that, that that's fine. Sally doesn't need her not to have done that. She just wants to know what happened to her mum. Exactly. And even if there is, I, I believe that it's said throughout the podcast, if she could just, if Marion could just let her know, even through a third party. Yeah, uh, because while people have the legal right to do that, to walk away from their families, morally it's indefensible. Sally's since had three children. They've never met their grandmother. And her son has died. Marion's son, Owen, took his own life. And you, you know, just think that a mother would want some... They were very close. Well, I'd, if New South Wales Police had investigated this the way we have they would have found what we've found and found that there's a really serious connection to this man in Luxembourg who has the same surname as what my mum changed her name to played soccer the same year as Johnny Warren did. I want to go to another point that sort of again adds to the to the sort of cloud of mystery that Marion left in which is the Southport School. And so on your podcast, you do an enormous amount of research into some very strange things happening at that school at that time. Can you tell us sort of the controversies and the accusations that have come out about that school? Yes. And, uh, you know, it's surprising that the Royal Commission into Institutional Child Abuse didn't feature this school um, barely at all. Uh, There is a Facebook site that um, has been developed for victims of the TSS, the Southport School, but really um, we uncovered and had for the first time a man come forward and talk about the abuse he suffered there, sexual abuse, from his father who was a long-time teacher and master at the school. Did that uh, teacher and master work alongside Marion? He was there at the same time as she was, but they weren't close in, in terms of the, the areas of the school. Marion yep. Marian started the preparatory class at TSS, so for the, the, the boys starting school there, and, and she converted the art room and she ran that program That's you know and did it really well and was beloved by the parents and, and other colleagues. But she did say to her daughter at, at one stage, um, not long before she disappeared, that someone had made a complaint about her touching boys. Now, she was devastated by this and very upset about it, when we looked further into it, that seems to be more that um, 
one of her colleagues thought she was a bit heavy handed with the boys in terms of grabbing them by the arm, pulling them out from under the, under the, 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 the chair or whatever. But um, that she never saw, I and mean, there was never any complaint about her abusing boys or hitting boys or behaving inappropriately with any of the boys, quite the reverse. And we've had numerous former colleagues who were in the room with Marion who knew her across different schools, across many years, adamant that she never could have, never did inappropriately deal with a boy. But we've since learned that at that school, it appears that there was a high incidence of sexual abuse of boys by the predominantly male staff there. Now, this is, uh, it's, it's horrific to, to hear about this and the specifics of, of what's alleged, but it's something we had to look at because one, when you start to wonder why would Marion disappear, you think, well, if she's been accused of something that bad and the school's a hotbed of uh, inappropriate conduct, if that's factored in, how would it have motivated her to do this? So we explore that avenue in detail in the podcast. Do you think it's possible that she knew something was going on and was threatened or anything like that? Is that possible? Well, that it is possible, of course, and that's why we eventually I, I, I thought, look, I have to look at WITSEC, Witness Protection, because a lot of people don't know, but we, we have a national witness protection program, each one managed by the states, and I spoke to a guy who was, used to be heavily involved in it with the um, AFP, Phil Cowlick, and he uh, wrote his PhD thesis on Australia's witness protection uh, regime. At the end of that discussion, he thought it was unlikely, but he couldn't rule out Marion being in witness protection because the protocols mean that even the detective investigating the case may not know that she's in there to protect her identity. You only get in witness protection not to um, as a reward for giving information, but because your life is in danger as a result of giving that information. Right. And it does, it can include other family members, but in Marion's case, where she has adult children, if she were to enter into that process, it would likely be just her and they would change everything and create a false trail, a false story to guarantee her anonymity and her safety going forward. Uh, She mentioned to me that someone had accused her of touching boys and it broke her heart. She has been a teacher for a very long time before I was even born. Um, And teaching was her passion and her life and it really made me very sad to hear that. You made the point that she was a fantastic teacher and that she, she was awarded for that. What is your theory as to why she left that school in a seemingly sort of abrupt manner? Because she left, but she quit before she went away, didn't she? She did. She wrote a resignation letter. And in that letter, she said that I plan to continue teaching. I might even be teaching in England. And can you please make sure my registration as a teacher is renewed? This is, does that sound like someone who's yeah. planning to vanish off the face of the earth? No, of course it doesn't. None, none, of, none of her actions do point to that. Um, but um, the reason she left so abruptly, well, th- that's the thing. It, it does point to the possibility of coercion, that her behaviour, her decisions were the direct result of coercion from a third party, a person or a group. And we've explored both of those possibilities and we've tracked that person of interest down, as I mentioned. We also got two very separate credible tips about one particular group, a cult named Hermes Far East and Shining. And they are based at Talgum near Mwillumbar in New South Wales, up in the north. And as recently as just a month ago, I was speaking to someone who was adamant Marion was serving them just over two years ago at cafe at the cafe that the cult owns in Talgum. Now, we've checked that out and we went and visited them and you can hear and see all of that. She wasn't there when we went there. Right. Why was this person adamant? What evidence did they have? Did they say they'd seen her? But They say that over the course of two years and frequently visiting that cafe, they'd been served multiple times by her, they were certain. Now, I think they're mistaken. We've looked at the various people involved in that cult and we think we know who they think they saw. And it's not Marion. But right. we got another credible tip from a different person. And one of the things they do is they all have very exotic names. One of the former members of that cult, I think her name was um, Pendulum Swings This Way and That. Mobius Bending, the strip, was the name of another person. So they have very exotic names. And what was it that sort of in the podcast was the impetus for you kind of going down that that possibility of a cult? Because that was something that came up quite 
early and I believe even family members of her kind of suggested it. Why Why was that something that, that seemed plausible? Because um, it seemed like the only rationable explanation to the family about why Marion would do something so completely out of character and the only thing that could possibly tear her away from her family because she was so close to her children uh, that uh, only a cult could brainwash her into walking away from them. She would never do that on her own. They, right. they still don't believe she would do that on her own. But um, early on, you know, uh, because uh, Marion did go to Tunbridge Wells and sent postcards from there, uh, someone pointed out, well, that's near East Grinstead, which is the, um, the headquarters for Scientology in um, the UK and Europe. And of course, I don't know if you know, I've, I've done a lot of work on Scientology over the years. Yes, I've, I was listening on the, on the podcast. That was such an interesting context. Yeah, I've done more stories on them than any journalist in the world. Wow. Uh, very early on, it didn't sound to me like she joined Scientology. They have a very different MO. Certainly they're capable of tearing families apart and convincing people to walk away from their lives. I don't think that's what happened in this case with Scientology. I don't think Marion was caught up with them. But that's where initially the idea of some sort of involvement with a group came in. And it turns out Hermes Far East and Shining have a long history going back to that time of recruiting people at spiritual fairs, including the woman we spoke to, who was a British Airways flight attendant who was recruited at a Mind Body Expo in London. Wow. So, so that, again, it's a plausible sort of explanation that you have to entertain. We, we certainly have not prejudged anything. And if there is a specific or repeated tips with enough evidence to investigate, we followed them. All of our 3 million listeners and counting, we're inviting them to help us solve it. And they yeah. are. Unlike other podcasts where everyone knows that's the guy who did it, or that's the guy who probably did it. We, we have no idea whether anyone did anything. Exactly we're right. trying to find out what happened and we're relying on other people helping us to do that. I'm Brian from Channel 7. This is Sally. We're trying to help Sally find him up. It's okay. a missing persons case. Right. Have you got a photo of it? I, I do. I've got a photo right here. Let's have a look. I'm sorry, I can't help you, sweet. Someone heard that we were here and she came out of whatever. If, like, I just want people to tell her that mm. she's welcome home. If I get too excited and I get too hopeful, I get crushed every time. So, yeah, yeah. you know, I've got, to, I've got to play my cards very close to my chest. I wanted to ask as well, because there's a little bit of speculation about who she, who Marion might have been dating or involved with at the time of her disappearance, especially because uh, Sally saw her in a car with a man one day and her reaction was very strange. What did you guys make of that? Well, that, that, that's the only interesting um, involvement, if you like, that piqued our interest because Marion was very open and she wasn't um, bringing a different guy home every night. It was nothing like that. I mean, she was seeing the the um, groundskeeper at uh, at the school where she was teaching and he'd come around for dinner. Sally knew him. The kids knew that they were seeing each other. She'd apparently seen one of the parents of one of the boys for some time. But this uh, night, not long before she disappeared, Sally was uh, just finished at TAFE. She was at McDonald's with her husband getting something quick to eat, looked out and saw her mum's car pull up at the driveway in the service station. And the reflection on the, the front window was quite discoloured, but she could see what she thought was a tallish man sitting in the passenger seat. And she thought, oh, I've busted mum. She's out with some guy. And so she's staring at her and Marion's quickly looked like a deer in the headlights, jumped in the car and tried to speed off, but she drove around the wrong way and got caught in the drive through So Sally <laughs> raced over and pointed at her as she drove past and said, gotcha. And she asked her the next day, who was that you're in the, you're in the car with? And she said, oh, it's a man I met at the, um, at the art centre. He was just taking me out for a drink before I go. And she said, well, you don't really drink. Why would you be embarrassed? You've never been embarrassed before. So that's why we're interested in who that person might have been. And uh, it does cast a huge shadow over the, the notion that she, on her own, decided to do all of this and take all of these actions and execute this very detailed and strange series of events before and after her disappearance. Because there's a possibility, it does seem strange that she didn't want Sally to drive her to the airport. And that suggests, and I think Sally has said this, that maybe she was meeting someone there and maybe they were going together. That's sort of a possibility. Do you think that's possible? Is that something that rings true to you? I do. That's a lead we're, we're checking because it was 22 years ago and it was on the cusp of digitisation and computers, you know, like the, the CCTV footage at the bank, that would have been really helpful. They had cameras, but they only turned them on when the bank was being robbed. Mm. Not like today where we're all being filmed all the time. Yeah. We'd solve this in two minutes today. 
Back then it was right on the cusp. The records are so hard to get hold of. Often they don't exist. You know, the post office we were hoping to get something from, that burnt down. Mm. <laughs> All the records are lost there. It's been a frustrating series of events. We, we have... We have a team of basically the four of us and, and three journalists, myself, Alice and Sandy and Sally Eels. They're both in Brisbane working on this on top of our full-time jobs as I'm a reporter for Seven News. I've already filed my story today so I can come <laughs> and do this because that's what it's been like. I've, I've put to bed you know, 150 plus stories for the news whilst I've been spending most of my time trying to find Marion Barter. And how long has this investigation that you guys have been doing, how long has that been going on for? We started in earnest in November last year and the first episode of the podcast was launched on April 1st. We're on hiatus from the main podcast at the moment until we get a major breakthrough, which we think is coming very soon. Do you think you're going to solve it? Yeah, I do. And so does Alison and so does Sally. I think we are going to solve it and we should solve it because um, Marion was a human being and human beings have two things. They have lives large, rich lives uh, within their, their their own sphere of friends and family. And because um, it's just not okay for Sally not to have closure on this. I found my father alive and well, but I only ever expected to find a grave or a photo. And I think that people are entitled to know and have that, to know what happened to their, their parents. You know, she wasn't abducted by aliens. I mean, that would be the only circumstance in which it would be okay for Sally not to know. It's possible. We haven't locked it in yet, but we're getting very close and we're going to find out what happened to Marion Barter and we're going to give Sally the closure she and her family deserve. Did you think from the outset that if Marion Barter was still alive, then with the popularity of this podcast, it would be pretty hard not to have heard of it. Do you think she would have got in contact if she was still alive? Look, I think she would have. And that's where, you know, Sally obviously gets asked all the time, what do you think's happened? Do you think she's alive? She thinks she probably has met with foul play and isn't alive. And that would explain why she hasn't reached out. There is a possibility that she feels because she's put Sally through so much, she doesn't want to compound that by now reaching out and going through all of that and explaining everything. And, you know, my father said that he never knew I existed. Well, I subsequently learned after he passed away that he'd known the whole time. And I guess that was his way of not putting me through the anguish mm. of him knowing that I was out there and, you know, where was he? Why, why didn't he reach out? I know it sounds odd, but there is a, a definite possibility that Marion could be alive and listening to this. And Marion, if you are listening, please just call Sally. There's no recriminations. She, she's not going to be angry at you. She just wants to speak to you and she'd love to introduce you to your grandkids. And just one last point, uh, we are uh, taking the New South Wales Police to the NCAT, the Administrative Tribunal. We had a hearing on Monday to get access to the file, the police file, because if they say she's disappeared, they're not doing any investigation, then let's have a look at the file. And one of the reasons we're doing that is to get Marion put on the missing persons database, the register, the national register. So there's a petition on change.org, missing person Marion Barter. Please go and sign it. We're hoping for 10,000 signatures. We've got 8,000 plus, so please go and sign it. Well, that will help us get Marion back in front of people. Could you also let us know if there are any listeners who do have any tips or any of this rings a bell? What's the, you have an email address, yep, don't you? The Lady Vanishes, all one word, the Lady Vanishes at seven, the word seven, dot com dot au. And you can go on to sevennews.com.au and just type in The Lady Vanishes. You'll see it there down down the page a bit. Just click on the link. That's our website. Email us, contact us. We've got a Facebook page, The Lady Vanishes on Facebook. Reach out to us. We do monitor it. We'll be in touch. Are you getting a lot of leads? We're getting a lot of leads, a lot of suggestions, mm -hmm. many of them for things we've already done yeah. or are, are working on, but they're, they're all welcome. And as I said, we've got some astonishing, astonishingly oh, good information and tips and leads. That personal ad. I just can't believe that was found. That was it's such an incredible lead. And as you said, it's too much of a coincidence. Well, uh, if it is a coincidence, it's what, it's the most <sighs> extraordinary coincidence I've seen in my 30 years as a journalist. Yes. And no. even the police say this, this missing persons case is by far the most baffling in Australian history. I completely agree. It just doesn't, doesn't add up. Defies understanding. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for speaking to us and for taking the time. We really appreciate it. And good luck. We will all be listening. Thank you. We'll come straight back and tell you what's happening yes. as soon as we get that breakthrough. <laughs> Thank you. If someone can prove to me that she is alive and well, I will accept it with open arms and I will get on with my life. Well, there what are you going to say to your mum if she does come I just give her a hug. And the first thing I do is introduce 
touch my kids. That's <laughs> pretty tough. Brian Seymour's podcast, The Lady Vanishes, is available wherever you get your podcasts. If you have any information that might be able to help Marion's daughter Sally find out what happened to her mum, then please email theladyvanishes at seven.com.au. You can also leave an anonymous tip at their website, www.theladyvanishes.org. You can sign the change.org petition to have Marion placed on the missing persons register by following the link in the notes of this episode. To get the latest updates and information on each episode, don't forget to join our group on Facebook. Just search for True Crime Conversations. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast, hosted by me, Jessie Stevens, and produced by Elise Cooper. <laughs>